chance and probability are integral to card game designs. No two matches play the same because of variance. However, this random nature can create unfun moments for players if they open a bad hand. Among the swath of ways designers have tried to limit this issue is to add cards that exist outside the main deck, creatures and abilities the player always has up their sleeve if they can meet the conditions. But are these cards from beyond friendly visitors from another world? Or invaders bent on destroying the balance of your game? Let's talk about it today on Draw 5 Move 5. Hey everyone, and welcome to the table. My name is Gabe, and this is Draw 5 Move 5, a show where we draw connections between the mechanics behind our favorite games. If you know me, you know I love Yu-Gi-Oh! It's my favorite trading card game and my longest running hobby. But right now we have a bit of a... problem. One that's cropped up before. For those unfamiliar, modern Yu-Gi-Oh! utilizes something called the Extra Deck, a pool of 15 special cards that can be summoned whenever the player meets certain conditions, in addition to the main deck. As in Yu-Gi-Oh!'s past, the vast pool of playable decks is getting a bit samey because certain powerful extra deck cards have become bona fide combo machines. The cards in question right now are Linkross and Crystron Hulk Fibrax, who I'll refer to as HAL for the remainder of this video. Together, these two cards make a low investment, easily accessible engine that combos into several negations, and unfortunately, it means many decks are playing them even if they wouldn't have before. Most decks can use the combo, and it's stronger than what they would accomplish otherwise, so they do it. The end result is a narrowing of deck diversity, and even if these cards get addressed in some way on an upcoming ban list, I'm afraid that's something I cannot allow to happen. Hypothetically, they're not the first, and they won't be the last cards to cause this issue. The question then becomes, if these cards are so frequently problematic, is Yu-Gi-Oh's extra deck, and mechanics like it in other TCGs, a healthy design element? Or is this just a case of a few bad apples ruining the bunch? In answering this question, it's important to note the difference between individually broken cards and a broken mechanic. Saffron Olive of MTG Goldfish mentioned this in his awesome video discussing Magic the Gathering's companion mechanic before its rule change. So just having one really push broken card doesn't make the whole mechanic bad, so the other thing we'll be looking for as we talk about these bad mechanics is mechanics where the actual design of the mechanic is a problem rather than just a single card or a couple of cards with that mechanic having the buttons push pulled a little bit too far and making that one card too powerful. We'll discuss companion as an example later, but to arrive at an answer to our question, we'll take the following steps. First, we'll break down why designers choose to use cards beyond the main deck, which we'll henceforth refer to as extra deck mechanics since it's less of a mouthful. Next, we'll look at the positives to these designs. Then, we'll address what can make them go wrong, and finally, the negatives when this occurs. As I mentioned in the intro, extra deck mechanics exist to address an inherent part of card game design, consistency and variance. Trading card games are similar to digital and analog RPGs in the sense that players have a toolbox of options at their disposal to use, but TCGs add variance to this mix. By drawing a subset of the deck to start a game, a player only has access to a small, randomized selection of their tools. It's one of the TCG's greatest design strengths as it turns the game into a puzzle of trying to assemble actions from the cards in hand, plan ahead, and cascade effects into each other to achieve a win condition but it's also one of the TCG's greatest design weaknesses. Variance isn't always fun. When players fail to draw a hand with cards they can really use, or don't draw the necessary resources to play their cards at all, it creates an unfun moment which can deter new players from the game and frustrate dedicated fans. While those who love TCGs know that these feels-bad moments happen from time to time, designers do their best to make these moments few and far between. They want to give players tools to manipulate the probability of drawing certain cards so they can find ways to make their decks more consistent. From this, we get some classic TCG design mainstays like multiple copies of cards allowed in the deck, cards that draw more cards to increase the chance of seeing something useful, or ramp and search effects that can pull specific cards a player needs right out of the deck and put them where they need them, whether that be in hand, on field, or in the graveyard. Another method, however, is using an extra deck mechanic. By placing some combo components, answers, and payoff cards in a zone outside the main deck, which the player can always access, 
after meeting certain conditions or paying a specific cost, designers give players another tool to manipulate the odds in their favor. Utilizing an extra deck mechanic has its benefits. The increase in consistency and control over variants is one, of course, but there are deeper additional upsides. First, cards like these can actually help streamline the deck building and playing process, making the game more accessible to new players. The effect text of the cards gives players a jumping off point to focus their strategy around, since they can reliably use them in most games, and the main deck cards can be geared towards casting or supporting them. In Yu-Gi-Oh, for example, the Crusadia archetype has an easy-to-understand strategy thanks to its extra deck monsters. Their effects rely on summoning or having monsters at their link points, the little red arrows, each providing a different benefit for doing so by searching archetypal cards or setting up for a one-turn kill. The main deck monsters can all summon two link points from the hand once a turn, and their effects, along with those of the spells and traps, protect the extra deck monsters and pave the way for a massive game-ending attack. Within the context of the archetype's extra deck monsters, Crusadia's strategy becomes clear. Summon a Crusadia monster, then ladder up with the link monster's effects to OTK, or gather protection and recovery if it's not possible to kill that turn. We see these extra deck mechanics streamline deck building in the Dragon Ball Super TCG with their leader cards, and even the Bakugan TCG with their Bakugan and factions. After the player understands how the strategy is meant to work, they can then use these effects to look for synergies with new cards and evolve the deck in a new direction, as with the Guard Dragon Crusadia variant, which took advantage of Spatha's movement effect to enable a powerful first turn negation strategy. A second benefit of extra deck mechanics is providing cool, powerful effects the player can rely on. These cards can be, well, powerful, and almost feel like the player's partner because of their reliability the one they work with the most to lead them to victory. This, in my opinion, is one of the greatest appeals to Magic the Gathering's Commander format. In addition to having effect text to help the player comb through Magic's massive log of cards for ones that will help cast or support that commander's playstyle, it just feels cool to have these powerful legends allied with you. Who wouldn't want a massive, indestructible Hydra on their side? A vampire whose cutthroat tactics will eliminate opponents, or a god that summons an endless swarm of locusts to drown out the enemy's wings as you swim in card advantage. Finally, extra deck mechanics can increase flexibility. This is most prominent in games where there are multiple cards outside the deck, or where the one additional card available has a few effects at its disposal. There are a plethora of cards that just wouldn't make the cut in a player's main deck because the effect isn't useful in every situation, and instead of drawing that card when they don't want it, they could be drawing a more useful card that contributes to their game plan. By putting these otherwise lackluster effects on a card the player can access when they need it, rather than whenever they happen to draw it, both players and designers are more likely to experiment with new ideas since it won't hurt a deck's consistency by doing so. Ukazi, a Yu-Gi-Oh spell card that does 800 damage to the opponent, has never really been useful since the player's life points only matter if it's the finishing blow. Gagaga -ga -ga Cowboy, however, an Xyz monster which has the same effect as Ukazi, has seen significant play over the years and even coined the phrase, cowboy for game, in the community. Cowboy doesn't need to be drawn to be played like Ukazi, just summoned when the player needs that last push of damage to finish their opponent and doing so is relatively easy since his summoning materials are two level 4 monsters, something many decks can and have been able to manage. This relative ease of access, however, is only acceptable because of the card's design. Its effects aren't overly powerful, and it isn't completely generic. In other words, the cost to access and use the card, in the context of its effect, is balanced. When this balance is disrupted, however, extra deck mechanics can go very, very wrong. If a card is hard to use and the effect isn't strong enough, it can be overshadowed by other options that are more useful in that easily accessible toolbox. If the card is too generic or easy to use, and the effect is good or even quite powerful, the negatives of these extra deck mechanics rear their ugly head, and the game can become a lot less enjoyable for everyone. First, extra deck mechanics can shrink the diversity of decks players see at their local card shops and in larger or online tournaments. As we discussed at the onset, Linkross and Hal have overtaken the Yu-Gi-Oh! metagame. 
even though there are a few different decks at the top, several of the top decks like Infernoble Knight and Dragon Link, which often make up over half the decks in the tournament representation, are using these cards as combo pieces, doing very similar things with them, and all of them not fun for the opponent. This can deter players from the game since most of their matches go the same way. We've seen this before with Nightmare Mermaid, allowing any deck that could summon two monsters to utilize a full Orcist combo whether they needed it or not, and are starting to see it with Pride of the Planet Verte Anaconda ending on Red Eye's Dark Dragoon. It gets boring pretty fast because games play out so similarly. The second negative is how these extra deck mechanics can break fundamental rules of the game. At their core, having additional cards at the player's disposal means they effectively have extra cards in their hand to start the game, but because they aren't in the hand, they become much harder to interact with. Introduced in Ikoria Lair of Behemoths, Magic the Gathering's companion mechanic is probably the best example of this. The companions each have a deck building restriction, which if met means they can be added to the player's sideboard but be cast whenever the player has the mana for it. They're functionally an eighth known card that is far harder to counter if they can come down early, especially because tools like discarding them from the opponent's hand don't work to remove them. Lurus of the Dream Den, for example, can be played turn 3 if the player is keeping up with the mana curve, earlier if they're ahead, and immediately breaks the game by allowing the player to cast a low cost spell from their graveyard once a turn. The majority of companions have effects like these, which add card advantage in addition to being an extra card on their own. Thankfully, the rules adjustment that requires them to be added to the hand first for 3 mana on their owner's turn lowered their prevalence and power, and they show up less often now in Standard. But even so, legacy formats have to keep some of these cards banned because of their low investment and combo potential. Beyond rules we find in the player's handbook though, extra deck mechanics can also break a game's fundamental design philosophy as a final negative consequence. There are different deck types in every card game, things like aggro, control, combo, and even midrange. They all perform in different ways and have different strengths and weaknesses, which is integral to not only providing fun experiences to different kinds of players, but to the design process of individual cards and decks. Extra deck mechanics, however, can completely shift and readjust how these decks function, removing their weaknesses and destroying the balance of different deck types. Before the September 2020 ban list, the Linkross and Hal combos were even more powerful than they are now. There were a few cards which added extra advantage to the combo lines, and Jet Synchron was the most accessible one card starter available. Control decks like Eldritch were playing this powerful combo as their core normal summon, giving them the benefits of both control and combo with none of the downsides. Pilots of this deck functionally had two decks at once, making it incredibly difficult to defeat. While Red Eye's Dark Dragoon hasn't quite taken over the TCG like it did in Japan, the card itself falls into not only control but aggro because of its effects, meaning control decks can close games faster than they normally could and aggro and combo decks have additional easy to access negation at their disposal to shore up their defenses if their main push doesn't work. It's basically a backup plan for any deck that's willing to play the three necessary engine requirements and can put two monsters on the field if everything else fails. With all of this in mind, let's turn back to our original question. Are extra deck mechanics a healthy design element to incorporate into a TCG? While there are definitely downsides, I think they are, as long as the cards put in said extra deck and the way they're implemented are balanced correctly. Since Companions tweaks, the majority of its cards are seeing a lot less play, and this is true of extra deck mechanics in other games. For every Link Cross Howl combo we get in Yu-Gi-Oh, there are hundreds of other Gagaga -Ga Cowboys and Crusadia extra deck monsters that are balanced enough in their cost or effect to be fair. Cards outside the main deck can provide an enjoyable solution to the issue of consistency many TCGs face, and provide a good amount of upside as long as we keep them balanced. If made too generic or powerful for the investment needed, that's when they can instead warp the game into a less diverse, less fun, and less interactive state. Thank you so much for watching. You have my humble and eternal gratitude. What did you think of the conversation? Do you agree that the concept of these extra deck mechanics is healthy, or do you think they can never be a good thing? And do you have any favorite examples of these mechanics? Maybe ones I didn't mention here? I'd love to hear your thoughts, so let's keep this discussion rolling down in the comments. If you enjoyed the conversation, subscribe and dingling that notification bell so you never miss an update. I'm putting out new videos on games and gaming mechanics the first Monday of each month, and dropping a like lets me know that you want to see more. 
You can follow the channel on Twitter and Facebook at Draw5Move5. It's the best way to find any important announcements, get hyped for new videos, and see any other useful game design content I've come across to share with you. My name is Gabe, this is Draw5Move5, and until next time, go have a good game.